So thank you for the invitation, and uh, I will try to to present you a broad view of these uh, funny things, which are the oscillations of rotating things. Uh, there are very unusual uh, uh, phenomena, and uh, so this is uh, the outline of my talk, and uh, I will. Uh, sort of browse uh, the, the, the subject. I, I try not to be too technical uh, because it's, uh, it can be uh, very rapidly, it can become very rapidly, uh, very mathematical, but uh, I will uh, refrain from that. Um, so let, let's start by a, a short introduction uh, of rotating fluids. So what is a, a rotating fluid actually? Uh, so it's a flow which is dominated by uh, solid body rotation, basically. So solid body rotation is not very interesting. And uh, usually you are interested in the little difference between solid body rotation and the, the true, uh, the, the full velocity. And so the, uh, the, the dynamics of rotating fluid is the dynamics of this little v when uh, its modulus is very small compared to the, uh, the solid body rotation. And uh, of course, this is a, a common situation in nature when you have large bodies like planets and stars, because then uh, R, the, the radial distance is very large, or uh, with technical device when uh, they spin very rapidly and uh, the omega is very large. Um, and all the, the dynamics of uh, rotating fluids, in fact, do, uh, has, uh, is, is special because, uh, because of the Coriolis force, which ensures the, the conservation of angular momentum. And in fact, uh, just an anecdote, uh, in the past, I had the, the, the possibility to, to play balls or football on the Coriolis platform uh, in Grenoble. And I can tell you that this was really a, a very strange experiment, completely uh, uh, disrupting. <laughs> in fact, you cannot anticipate what's the, the motion of the, of the bodies of the balls when, you, when everything is rotating, when you are in a rotating frame and uh, with a strong uh, Coriolis uh, uh, force ac or acceleration. So all this uh, special dynamics comes from that, and, uh, and we will see uh, what are the consequences. So some example where uh, we should uh, use this uh, rotating, uh, rotating frames for uh, managing the, the fluid dynamics. Of course, the first uh, example we have uh, under our eyes is the Earth, and uh, the Earth is, uh, has a linear velocity at the equator, which is about uh, 500 uh, meters per second. And this is very large uh, if you compare with the, the motions in the oceans, uh, a little bit less in the atmosphere where you, where you have a, where a, a ratio of 10 between the two velocities. But it's even uh, very even stronger in the liquid core of the Earth, where the, the motions are very slow, and uh, of course there you are very strongly dominated by the, the, the background rotation. But as I said, this is also the, the case in stars, where you have uh, typical velocities of for rapid, what are called rapidly rotating stars uh, with uh, velocities of. Uh, 100 kilometers per second uh, or even higher, and uh, local velocities which are around uh, the kilometer per second. Jupiter is also a, a good example of a fast rotating body uh, with uh, winds uh, with uh, 100 meters per second, which, are, which is a small velocity compared to the, the rotational one. So on all these bodies, you have to work with in the rotating frame and uh, and uh, investigate the, the dynamics uh, in this frame with the, the Coriolis force. 
uh, other examples, there are, of course, lab experiments which are designed for that. And uh, uh, since uh, we do not have in these experiments very big uh, containers, we use the other, the other way, that is uh, making the, the rotation rate uh, very, very high. Uh, the, these problems of uh, spinning uh, tanks uh, in satellites, uh, the people have studied that because of instabilities which were raised by the, the rotation of the satellite, um, which were the elliptical instability. Uh, and also in the, the centrifugation and uh, when you, for instance, when you want to recycle paper and uh, you have to separate the ink and, uh, and uh, the, the paper paste. But let, let's uh, go back to astrophysics and uh, just to give uh, concrete examples, uh, the sun is, uh, is rotating, but quite slowly, actually. Uh, its rotation period is uh, around uh, 30 days, uh, 24 days at equator and 38 days at the pole. So it's rotating differentially. Uh, but we have stars in our neighborhood like Altair, which is uh, five parsec uh, away from the sun and uh, which is a fast rotator and uh, whose uh, rotation period is eight hours. So uh, almost a hundred times faster than the sun. And uh, as a consequence, it's very uh, strongly uh, centrifugally uh, dis uh, flattened. Uh, and uh, usually uh, what we say is that young stars rotate rapidly because they have uh, the angular momentum of their formation and old stars uh, rotate slowly because uh, well they have uh, uh, they have lost uh, angular momentum thanks to some magnetic breaking for instance and also massive stars rotate rapidly statistically because they are young uh, and uh, low mass stars rotate slowly also statistically because they are statistically old and uh, and they have also magnetic fields on the surface which can remove angular momentum quite easy uh, more efficiently so the the case of stars of young stars is always uh, uh, they have a uh, yes the, the, the problem is always to to deal with fast rotation and I show here the example of Altair on which I'm, I'm working presently. Altair is this, uh, this star in the eagle, constellation of Eagle, this bright star. And if you zoom, if you were able to zoom uh, to it uh, very uh, <laughs> strongly, uh, you could see that, uh, which is uh, an image reconstruction with uh, interferometric data and uh, with which we can measure the, the, the centrifugal flattening of the star and the orientation of its rotation axis, thanks to the fact that uh, in uh, fast rotating stars, the, the pole is brighter than the equator because in fact, the pole is closer to the center and uh, the temperature gradient is stronger along the pole than along the equator. And uh, if you just use Fourier's law, uh, the flux is uh, stronger at the pole than at the equator. And this is one way to, uh, to get the, the 3D orientation of these uh, fast rotators. And uh, very recently we observed Altair with uh, spectroscopy. And I show here on the, on the left, this is the, the mean profile of a line. And we were looking at the little wiggles that you see on these and which are uh, a thousand times uh, smaller than, uh, than this, than this level. It's uh, uh, about, yes, uh, perturbation of order 10 to minus three. And when you follow these uh, perturbation, you see that these are waves, in fact, that moves from the, so from the, the blue shifted side of the, uh, of the line, which is uh, so in longitude, that would be a minus 90 degrees from the meridian. 
and you see these waves which propagate uh, from the, the east side to the west side. And uh, if you do a sort of Fourier transform of the, this, uh, the, this structure, if you can see my mouse here, uh, a cut like this, uh, then you have an idea of the azimuthal wave number uh, of this wave. Uh, and you see that this wave number M uh, is about uh, 10. Uh, and you have these uh, uh, funny uh, things, uh, funny structures, which look like that the wave, uh, there is a perturbation with, where the waves increases its M during its propagation. Maybe it's like, uh, you know, some wave which is going to break and which increase its wave number. Uh, I show here the, the, the frequencies which can be measured when you just do a Fourier transform along this red lines, which is, uh, which is time. Uh, and you see that uh, from these uh, data, you can uh, learn a lot of things uh, on the, the dynamics of the, the surface of, the, of a star like, uh, like Altair. Of course, Altair is a very bright star, so you have a, a strong signal uh, which you can uh, analyze uh, rather accurately. Um, so doing this is very interesting because when you detect waves, you have access to the, the physical mechanism which uh, give uh, birth to the waves. And for instance, if you detect acoustic waves, then you have, uh, you have access to a measure of the sound speed in the star. If you detect uh, gravity waves, internal gravity waves, then you have access to the brand weissele frequency, which means that you have access to the entropy gradients times the gravity. And uh, if, you have, if you see inertial waves, like actually uh, the, these uh, Altair's waves are, uh, then you have access to, uh, to rotation or the details of rotations uh, of rotation in the, in the star. And uh, very recently, in fact, these inertial waves, which are restored by the Coriolis force, uh, have been detected on the solar surface. And I would like to show you a little video from uh, my colleague, uh, Laurent Gison, uh, so I will try to launch that. Uh, so, and I think I should, uh, yes, uh, I should change the chair, the sharing. Okay. So, okay, can you see the, the video? Uh, yeah, yeah, we can, yeah. Okay. So what you see here is a uh, observation, in fact, of the so the, the surface of the sun, and uh, and structures on the so on the left side these are for reconstruction from the data as far as I understood, and uh, so the you see the frequencies are negative because the, the these waves are uh, retrograde, so they are propagating uh, counter in the counter rotating. Uh, direction. And uh, on the right, there are models which have been done by solving the eigen, uh, the eigen problem of that. Uh, what I wanted to stress is that these observations, in fact, have been possible because we have now a very long, uh, uh, very long base of data for the, the observation of the sun due to the from the SDO, the Solar Dynamics Observatory, uh, which has now been observing the sun for uh, 10 years almost. And so we can see very low frequencies because you see that uh, these frequencies, uh, 86 nanohertz. So uh, you need a time base, which is uh, uh, at least uh, five years and uh, to, to see such low frequencies. And that, that was the problem we had uh, with uh, observations of, the, of inertial waves because they are low frequency waves, as I will uh, show later. So that good news, in fact, uh, the, this detection of uh, 
of these waves on the surface of the sun, they are very interesting because they, they, they tell us about the rotation inside the sun. Uh, of course, the, the waves do not uh, sample uh, everywhere in the sun, but they, they sample at least the, the, the convection zone. So I will stop the video, or run it again <laughs> very quickly, and then change and go back to the, the slides. Okay. Uh, so I go back to the slides. Here it is. Okay. So now another way to detect waves. It's the, the very old way of uh, uh, detecting the, the fluctuations of, uh, of brightness of a star. And uh, so you have such curves like this. And uh, now we have plenty of, the, of such data because uh, people have been uh, watching stars in order to detect uh, exoplanets. But as a side product, we have all many, many uh, light curves uh, where, which we can use to uh, infer the, the physics of the stars and uh, measure uh, all what uh, we would like. And uh, for instance, uh, there, there was this Kepler mission which observed the region of the sky during four years. And so we have a very long, in this case, very long uh, time series, which uh, are very uh, powerful to, uh, to detect low frequencies and uh, to, in, to infer very new constraints on the, the stellar structure. Um, so when, when you get this, you Fourier transform these uh, light curves and you get uh, all these sets of eigenmode, eigenfrequencies. And of course, then the game is to interpret these uh, eigenfrequencies in order to uh, uh, recover or to, uh, yes, to recover the, the physical properties of, of the star or to constrain them. Uh, another way, and uh, I know that Adrian is more <laughs> familiar with that, is, uh, is the role that uh, the, the waves play in the tidal dissipation because tides, as you know, on Earth can uh, excite waves uh, and waves dissipate energy. And uh, thanks to this dissipation, then you can uh, circleize the orbits of, uh, uh, of stars, of uh, binary stars. Uh, but you can also dissipate energy inside the, the star, and uh, this has uh, effects, uh, for instance, uh, on satellites. Uh, I will show you the, this, uh, this picture, which was taken by Cassini, of uh, the, this uh, moon of Saturn, where you can see geysers, uh, which are thought to be uh, driven by some energy which is injected by the tides uh, into this moon. I worked on that, but uh, the results was not uh, so, <laughs> uh, the dissipation was not strong enough. Uh, but uh, for the, so uh, there is, uh, uh, I mean, some power is, uh, is dissipated by the, the tides, but uh, we have to have uh, good models of uh, the, the, this tidal dissipation to, uh, to infer the, the real power which is uh, dissipated in, inside. And uh, of course, it's not a, a trivial business to, uh, uh, to compute this, this power dissipated by the, the tides. Uh, another consequence of this uh, tidal excitation of mode is uh, in mixing uh, in double stars since, of course, uh, you uh, you generate uh, flows in the stars, and uh, then uh, you can uh, induce some uh, large scale flow and uh, transport elements uh, uh, in the very uh, in the different uh, parts of the stars, and uh, that may have consequences on the observation because you might see at the surface of the stars some material which has been uh, synthesized in the uh, uh, in the core of the star. So that's an, another reason for studying the, the impact of uh, excited waves. So uh, let me now focus more uh, 
strongly on these kinds of waves, which are inertial waves or inertial modes, which are specifically associated with, uh, with rotation. And uh, I just to, to, to keep uh, things uh, simple, uh, I've wrote here the, the momentum equation uh, for an incompressible uh, fluid, constant density, constant viscosity, uh, where I scaled this equation with the Coriolis uh, frequency to omega. Uh, and some uh, length scale uh, L, big L. Uh, <clears throat> and what you see is that you have two, non uh, two numbers which emerge, the famous Rossby number, which is in front of the nonlinear terms, and the no not so famous Ekman number, uh, which uh, measures the, the viscosity of the, of the fluid. Uh, <clears throat> In, uh, in the situation where the, the rotation is dominated, these two numbers are usually small. And in fact, uh, it's quite uh, easy to see for the Rossby number, since we said that uh, V was uh, very small compared to the rigid body rotation. So L should be of the size of the body. Uh, and so when we are considering uh, a fluid flow in the rotating frame, uh, we should, uh, we are always in the limit of very small Rossby numbers. And uh, so the, the consequence of that is that if you take the limit, so set uh, the Rossby number to zero, then uh, you have you ha basically with uh, linear uh, dynamics, which makes the thing simpler. Uh, I would say. So we are left with that. So I added the mass conservation and you should have add, of course, boundary conditions. Now, if I uh, focus on time periodic motions, so I assume this time dependence, then you have this eigenvalue problem. Uh, which solutions are these uh, so-called uh, inertial modes? Uh, so I first uh, eliminate this, uh, the geostrophic mode, which is in fact the steady solution, which has this uh, property of being a balance between the Coriolis force and the pressure gradient. And uh, an equation which when you take the curl of that, uh, gives this uh, so-called the Taylor-Prodman uh, theorem, which says that the, these uh, steady flows, in fact, are in the forms of columns, which are parallel to the rotation axis. Then, if we uh, consider so uh, non-zero frequencies, uh, we have these inertial modes, and they have these properties of being orthogonal to each other uh, with this uh, scalar product, and they are low frequency. You can show that the, uh, the pulsation is necessarily smaller than two omega, which makes, for instance, on Earth, the inertial modes have a period which is larger than 12 hours. And uh, you can show in some uh, simple cases that uh, these modes form a complete basis on which you can expand uh, any function. But this has been, this is a mathematical result that has been demonstrated only in the full ellipsoid, the full sphere and the annular channel. And for instance, there is an open question for the, the cylinder where we know the, uh, we know the, the analytics uh, expression of these modes, but we don't know if they form a complete basis or not. So. <laughs> A question for the, the mathematicians. Um, one property of these uh, low frequency modes is that they, they form uh, a dense spectrum in this uh, in this range, uh, zero to omega. That means that if you choose any real number inside that, then you can approach this number as uh, close as you want. Uh, choosing a uh, mode frequency. And I show here an example of a dense set in, uh, in this uh, interval. 
So you can just choose N and M such that you approximate any number inside this, uh, this range. Um, all this, in fact, is related to this, uh, to the Poincaré equation, which is the, the equation which governs uh, pressure perturbations. In fact, this, uh, this equation is special because it is hyperbolic, spatially. You see here that we have only the spatial coordinates. And in fact, such a problem is mathematically ill-posed because hyperbolic problems uh, they demand initial values, not boundary conditions. And uh, if you impose boundary conditions, then you, you, you may face uh, singularities. And I will show you very quickly why this is like this. Uh, if you consider the wave equation, which is the, the prototypical uh, problem of uh, the, a hyperbolic problem, so here you see we have space and time, and you can solve this equation by this change of variable uh, using the, the characteristic vari uh, variable u and v. And when you do this change of variable, you get this very simple equation, which is equivalent to saying that the, uh, the, uh, the solution is uh, the sum of these two functions where capital F and capital G are set by the, the initial conditions. So you need two initial conditions at uh, zero time, for instance. And once you specify these initial conditions, then the, uh, the solution is completely known. But now if you use boundary conditions, which means in this uh, frame that you impose initial conditions, for instance, on this line, uh, t equals zero, but you impose also final conditions. At some time, you impose that the function should verify this. And uh, from that, you can see that, uh, in fact, that might generate a singularity. Uh, for instance, if you have a boundary conditions, for instance, at uh, some x, just uh, in that case, in fact, any value, for instance, in m, is a consequence of the, the initial value, which is given here, and the final value, which is given here. So if you specify the values of the function here and here, then you specify the value in M. And if this value is different from the, the boundary condition, uh, then you have, of course, a jump in the function and uh, you have a, a singularity. This is one kind of uh, singularities that, that can emerge. Um, and this is to illustrate the fact that the, the, the problem is not well posed. The solution is not unique or it's not uh, regular. Uh, in fact, uh, in the case, for instance, of a spherical shell, the Poincaré equation uh, characteristic lines are straight lines. And if you follow these uh, lines, uh, like uh, a wave which would be propagating uh, along this line, in fact, you see that the, this line tend to focus around a periodic orbit, uh, which we call an attractor. And uh, we have studied these, uh, uh, these structures and uh, what, uh, the, the consequence of these, uh, of these attractors is that you have also singular solution on these attractors. In fact, the, all the energy of a, an initial perturbation concentrate along the attractor. And if there is no viscosity, then it would uh, reach uh, an infinite uh, amplitude. Of course, viscosity is always present and this smooth the uh, this singularity and transform this singularity into a shear layer, an oscillating shear layer. And uh, well, now some years ago, we studied this in the, the 2D case, uh, in fact, to understand what was the, uh, the shape of these shear layers, uh, what was the structure of them. And we could uh, solve this problem using uh, an asymptotic analysis uh, and we discovered that, uh, for instance, the, the shear layers had a width of uh, the Ekman number to the power one fourth. Um, 
And for, from that, we could uh, derive the uh, differential equation, which determines the the structure of the uh, the structure of the shear layer. And in fact, this is a, a Schrödinger equation of a quantum particle trapped in a parabolic uh, well. And uh, well, uh, and for that, we could reproduce this shape of the, the shear layer. Uh, so this is a cut of the shear layer. This is the velocity. And here you have the numerical solution and the analytical one. And uh, you, you don't see any difference uh, if the, the Ekman number is low enough. Uh, in the 3D case, then the, the things are more complicated. And presently, we do not have uh, such, uh, uh, such analytical solutions. And in fact, the, the things are more complicated because we found that uh, there are three categories of eigenmodes. There are modes on attractors, modes which are generated by the critical latitude and quasi-regular modes. I will just present them briefly. Uh, this was just to show that, uh, uh, or maybe I should, uh, yes, I should discuss this. Uh, this is uh, just concentrate on the right uh, picture here. Uh, I can't see my, yes. Um, here you see, in fact, the, the, the propagation of the shadow of the core. And uh, for a, a, a frequency, which is the sign of a rational fraction of pi, then you have a periodic orbit of this shadow. Yes, I should say that uh, for inertial modes, in fact, the, the angle between the rotation axis and the characteristics is determining the, the frequency of the mode. So that's a simple property of these waves. And uh, so if the, the core is small enough, then you have these, uh, 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 these periodic orbits of the shadow and a characteristic which starts from, let's say, uh, the, the, gray, uh, uh, the, the, the gray region remains in the gray regions and, uh, and loops back. Uh, the same in the white wine, uh, but if the core is uh, uh, large enough, then there is no such uh, periodic orbits. And uh, the, the consequence of that is that the, the distribution of eigenvalues, as you can see here, is uh, when the core is small, they, they are distributed in, uh, in families in the complex plane. So here, this is the complex plane. And once the, the core is big enough, then they are just randomly distributed. Uh, so what you could uh, say is say, okay, let's have a, a simple angle. Let's say we take, for instance, uh, pi over four. So we have uh, characteristics which are just 45 degrees inclined with respect to the rotation axis. And in this case, you see that the, the eigenvalues in the complex planes that are just ordered in, in families and uh, they are very, just like a, a very well posed uh, eigenvalue problem. Of course, things are not uh, so simple. And uh, if you decrease the viscosity, uh, what happens is that these nice, uh, these nice uh, structures of the, the wave, uh, the, uh, the eigen mode, which you see here is just like a wave which oscillate uh, parallel to the characteristics. Uh, in fact, this is uh, disrupted into uh, finer structures uh, as the, the Ekman number decreases. And when it tends to zero, then you, uh, the, 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 the regularity of the spectrum is, uh, is destroyed. So that's the quasi-regular modes that we found, in fact, near these uh, frequencies, which are uh, a few uh, rational fraction of pi, uh, which are the sign of that. Now, the, there are also critical latitude modes, which are actually generated by the, the singularity, which uh, happens to exist around this, uh, this critical latitude. The critical latitude is the place on the inner core where the characteristic is tangent to the core. Uh, 
And this ger generates a family of, uh, of modes, of eigen modes, which you can see here in the complex plane. Um, now, and the last uh, families of modes is the ones which are uh, sitting on attractors and uh, which have uh, some, uh, uh, which are waves sort of trapped in a, in a well, which is designed by the attractor. Uh, we have tried to, to understand the, the, in, an, in an analytic way the, the structure of these, uh, of these modes uh, in, uh, in 3D, and for uh, the moment it has resisted uh, our assault. <laughs> but we have found that in the, the structure of these uh, shear layers are governed by oscillation on the one third power of the Ekman number, uh, the envelope of this wave packet is scaling with the one fourth power of the Ekman number, and all this is sitting at the distance of one sixth power of the, the true attractor. So the true attractor is here, and the, the shear layer is here and here. Uh, we are trying to analyze this, and uh, what has uh, popped out uh, the, this analysis is that in fact, the natural small number, small parameter is the one twelfth power of the, uh, of the Ekman number. So, which is not a very small parameter because uh, uh, in real system, in fact, a typical uh, value of the Ekman number is 10 to minus 12, 10 to minus 15. And when you take this power, you see that uh, you, you raise the, this, uh, this small parameter uh, quite, uh, quite well. So uh, I skipped this. Uh, these are technical details which are not very interesting. And uh, yes, and now I will try to, I will move to a more realistic configuration because presently I was just dealing with uh, uh, a rigidly uh, constant density fluid in a spherical shell, but you might wonder that in stars we have uh, some uh, stratification uh, and this uh, makes uh, the low frequency mode more complicated because you have an additional force, which is uh, the buoyancy. And in fact, inertial modes, they combine with gravity mode and they form the, the gravito inertial modes uh, simply because gravity modes are also low frequency modes. And uh, <clears throat> you can uh, analyze this with a simple Boussinesque configuration where you have here the, uh, the buoyancy, alpha is the, this is the dilation coefficient and T is the temperature perturbation. And this is the, the energy equation. So the equation for temperature. And uh, when you mix all this, uh, you get, uh, for instance, for the pressure perturbation, you get this, uh, this equation where I wrote only the highest uh, order derivative, just to show that, uh, in fact, um, for this perturbation, the, the nature of the equation is changing. In fact, we have a, uh, a mixed operator that is, in some parts, the, the operator is uh, hyperbolic, and in other parts of the domain, it is uh, elliptic. And this comes from the fact that the, the Brent Faisalet frequency, N, is varying inside the, the, the fluid. Uh, and we have, of course, the, the critical surfaces, which are separating the hyperbolic and the elliptic domains, uh, which, are, which can be uh, computed. Um, and in that case, well, the, the characteristics are no longer straight lines, but then they also converge to attractors, but you have also these attractors are either periodic orbits or points. And uh, well, this is old work we did uh, 20 years ago with uh, Boris Dintrans. And I will show you these uh, nice uh, eigen modes where you see that the, the well, the, the eigen function is concentrated 
around an attractor. And this attractor is, for instance, in, in the, the, this figure in the middle, is bouncing on the, the turning surface, which separates the hyperbolic domain, where you have the, the mode, uh, from the elliptic one, which, where you have no amplitude. And you have also attractors, which are just the, the focusing of the waves, in, which are sort of uh, uh, trapped. Uh, uh, excuse me, I have a phone call. Hello? Okay, je suis en talk. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, and uh, so here it's a, a simpler attractor uh, that we have and which are designed by the, these uh, turning surface and the boundary. Uh, another way to generate uh, new things is uh, to consider differential rotation because stars are all rotating differentially, uh, more or less uh, strongly. We, we saw that the sun was uh, rotating differentially uh, in the outer parts. Uh, I show you here a model of a fast rotating star, which uh, I computed uh, with the, the, the Ester code and where the, the star is rotating at 80% uh, of the critical angular velocity. So it's quite strongly flattened. And the color here shows the, the different, from the rotation rate. And you see that the core is rotating uh, much faster than the, in fact, the envelope. And among the envelope, in fact, the pole, the, the polar regions are rotating slowly, more slowly than the, the equator one. So you have these uh, latitudinal uh, differential rotation, which are due to the baroclinicity, in fact, of the, of the configuration. In fact, it's a sort of, in fact, it is the thermal wind uh, that we see here. And so uh, we have uh, studied this. Uh, so you can uh, compute or derive the equations of uh, the inertial modes when you have differential rotation. And we assume that this, uh, uh, well, the, uh, the background flow was only in the phi direction. And so we use a, an inertial frame just because there is no privileged frame when the, the star is rotating differentially. Uh, and uh, I skip on that. Yes, maybe just to, uh, what we found is that uh, the, uh, the operator is uh, again a mixed operator. So with uh, uh, elliptic regions and hyperbolic regions. And what you find is again, attractors, which are uh, with funny shapes like this. But you see also that uh, you do not need the core to make the attractor. In fact, the attractor exists just because it bounces on the, the turning surface here, the, this uh, straight line, uh, and uh, it's generated like this. Uh, what we found also is that, uh, of course, when you have a differential rotation, then you can have co-rotation layers, which are layers where the, uh, where the phase speed of the wave uh, has the, the same speed as the, as the fluid. Uh, of course, this exists only for non-axisymmetric uh, modes. So if an, you have a non-axisymmetric uh, wave, so it propagates uh, around the, the, it propagates in longitude and at some place, uh, the, the wave angular velocity may match the, the fluid angular velocity. And uh, this is, generates these uh, corrotation layer, which are places where you have a very strong dissipation, which is very interesting, of course, uh, as far as, for instance, tidal dissipation is, uh, is concerned. Uh, we have also tried the, the, the fully mixed thing, uh, that is, uh, since uh, when you impose uh, a stable stratification in, in a fluid with, combined with rotation, you have, you generate a differential rotation and therefore you have gravito-inertial modes 
on a background which is differentially rotating. And that was the PhD thesis of uh, Giovanni Miru, uh, who studied this. And of course, the picture is quite complicated because uh, uh, maybe I will skip that. Because you have, uh, depending on the frequency that you choose, you have uh, hyperbolic regions uh, which have uh, funny shapes like this, uh, for instance, the D or the F. Uh, and uh, this leads uh, to, uh, to modes like this. Uh, I show here a non axisymmetric mode, uh, which is unstable, actually. Uh, probably destabilized by the, this region uh, where the, so the differential rotation can inject energy in the mode. Um, so now let, let, let's talk a little bit about forced flows, since these flows are uh, uh, are interesting when you consider the, the tidal interaction of stars or stars and planets or planets and satellites. Um, and that, that was a, this is a strong motivation for studying these uh, forced flows. And uh, <clears throat> this is, so that's what I said, uh, because you have, of course, uh, you are interested in the way energy is dissipated uh, and how much energy is dissipated. And actually that was the, <laughs> that was the subject of my PhD thesis when uh, I, I was uh, uh, studying the, uh, the power dissipated uh, in, uh, in low mass X-ray binaries where you have a very small, uh, uh, very small star orbiting a neutron star or a white dwarf. And this, uh, the little star, uh, since the system is uh, very uh, uh, is very close, then the, the orbital period is very short, and you have gravitational radiation from this system, and therefore the the system is losing angular momentum. The things are the stars, the orbital motion is accelerating, and you have so uh, always uh, an acceleration, a spin up. Of the star, which is uh, locked by tides, uh, and uh, I was uh, supposed to, uh, I did <laughs> compute the, the power dissipated in the stars and try to and compare that to the, uh, in fact, to the luminosity of the stars to, to see if that that could have an influence, and it had no influence. That was the consequence, the result. So uh, let's come back to the, the tides and, uh, and the waves. Uh, there was a, a remark by Gordon uh, Ogilvie, uh, who said that, uh, well, since the shear layers uh, in, these, uh, in this system are scaling like the one third power of the Ekman number, then a consequence of that is that the total viscous dissipation uh, in a, in a body, if you specify the, the frequency, uh, this uh, dissipation is independent of the viscosity, which is uh, very interesting because uh, viscosity is always ill known. You never know exactly if you have turbulent viscosity or uh, whatever, uh, what are the, the small scale flow inside the star. And so if the, the global dissipation is independent of that, that's a re really great. Uh, so that was a great result, but unfortunately, <laughs> some years after we found, we studied this in more details and we found that uh, in fact, that was not uh, really the case. If you consider all the, the frequencies that are possible and you see here, the, the dissipation, the total dissipation as a function of frequency. And what you see is that it's very, uh, uh, very spiky. And uh, what, uh, well, what is not shown here is also that the, the, the spikes are depending on the Ekman number. Uh, and in fact, you have resonances. So that was, of course, uh, for a 2D problem, but uh, in 3D it remains, actually. Uh, you have many resonances which depend uh, on the viscosity. Uh, you have some uh, places 
in the frequency range where the dissipation is independent of viscosity, that's true. And you have also novelties, uh, that is uh, what I called anti-resonances, that is places where if you decrease the, the viscosity, then the dissipation goes to zero, which is uh, interesting as far as uh, the influence of tides are concerned, because uh, if for some frequencies you have zero dissipation, then the, the system might be locked at these uh, frequencies and oscillate around them. Uh, uh, of course, and uh, you have also pr the prominent role of the shear layer, which is emitted by the critical latitude that I should show uh, uh, pictures to explain this. So that's the same uh, dependence of the dissipation as a function of the frequency for different uh, Ekman numbers. And you see that uh, here, for instance, the, the curve are not uh, uh, superposing. Uh, so there is a dependence uh, with uh, the Ekman number. But what, what was very strange when we studied this in, uh, 2000, in, in 2010, in 2010, uh, with my colleague uh, Lorenzo Valdetaro, was that uh, we we knew we knew the what were the eigen modes, for instance, this mode which is associated with uh, a strong uh, uh, a strong attractor. So we forced the shell to oscillate at this frequency, so at the eigen frequency, and what we found was that. So. Sorry, <clears throat> some um, a response of the fluid which was not concentrated on the eigen mode, which is quite surprising. And actually, for the moment, uh, we do not understand the, the, why this is like this. In fact, the, the, this is a body forcing, uh, so the, the the oscillation is maintained by a, a body force. And what you see is that. It, in fact, the, the response of the fluid starts from this uh, critical latitude. So the critical latitude seems to play uh, an important role in the, the, forced, uh, the forced flows. And this uh, brings me to, to the, the last part uh, of my talk, which is the recent results that uh, we obtained with uh, my colleagues in Marseille, uh, so uh, this Ji uh, Yang He is a Chinese student, very good student, and uh, Benjamin Favier, Favier and uh, Stéphane Le Dizès. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the, the student managed to generalize uh, a result that, uh, that was obtained um, by Moore and Safman in the... <laughs> in the 60s, in the 1960s, uh, on uh, analytical uh, solutions for steady flows. And uh, where the, 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 they could derive the, the shape of the, this, uh, of shear layers, of steady shear layers, and then they, they generalize this to these oscillating layers. So they choose this, this configuration, that is they choose a, a frequency which makes the, uh, the characteristics at 45 degrees from the rotation axis. So you, you just choose a frequency which is one over the square root of two. Uh, and uh, for in this case, in fact, you, you have uh, 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 sorry, um, I'm forgetting the words. <laughs> uh, you have a cyclic uh, path for the characteristics, and uh, you can compute the, the response of the fluid. And uh, well, the expression is quite complicated. You see, this is a, such an integral, uh, which looks like a Laplace transform, but you have uh, an analytic uh, solution for the, the, the shape of the, of the velocity field, the, the, the shape of the, yes, of the velocity field in the shear layer. And one of the interesting result is that this, uh, the amplitude of the velocity field is uh, scaling with the 1 12th power uh, of the Ekman number for shear layers, which are of the 1 third power. 
And that was a new result because it was thought, and uh, I think that this was a paper of uh, which Kurzweil in the 1990s, uh, who found that that, that was in fact uh, the one sixth power. But in, in fact, when you, you solve, you really solve this problem, you find that this uh, very low uh, exponent, uh, one, third, one twelfth power, which makes also the, the analysis of this uh, of this squid flow quite uh, difficult because uh, uh, this uh, this number is not going uh, to zero very quickly. Uh, you must uh, have in mind that the smallest Ekman number you can consider in stars is about ten to minus eighteen, and so you see ten to minus eighteen at the one twelfth power is uh, 10 to minus three, uh, no, not 10 to minus three, uh, less, even less. Uh, 10 to minus, uh, well, you make the calculation. <laughs> so that's the, the latest uh, thing and uh, the latest results that uh, have been obtained. So on uh, the fluid flows, so on the forced flows uh, in a spherical shell. And the forcing, yes, I should uh, say uh, how the forcing was. It was not a bulk forcing, but it was a liberating core. So the, the core was rotating and its rotation was modulated uh, by a small uh, oscillation, uh, which is typical of uh, libration. So to, to conclude the, the, this talk, uh, I think I'm nearly finished. Uh, so what you see, uh, what I, I wanted to, to show you with this uh, talk is that uh, the, the dynamics of rotating fluid, in fact, um, is quite complicated. And in fact, of waves, as you see. And all this, in fact, is rooted in the fact that the Poincaré equation, which governs the, uh, the inertial mode, is a hyperbolic equation. So it sets uh, an, an ill-posed problem. Uh, as a consequence, uh, the, the, the spectrum uh, of inertial mode is, uh, is really complex. In fact, and in 3D, we see that uh, the, we have many sorts of, uh, of eigenmodes. And uh, in addition, if you have differential rotation, then you see that you change the nature of the operators, and uh, then you, you can have, uh, you have a, a mixed operator, you can have instabilities, and of course, all this needs to be uh, studied uh, thoroughly. Um, and some open question, uh, uh, the, the one which is uh, still uh, uh, puzzling me is how to obtain uh, an asymptotic uh, theory for the eigenvalues of the inertial modes in a spherical shell. Uh, for the moment, we have an uh, analytic solution in the 2D case uh, for the eigenvalues. We have analytic solution for the fourth problem in the spherical shell, but we do not have uh, analytical solutions for, uh, uh, for modes in a uh, for 3D modes, uh, actually, in, in, a, in a real uh, spherical shell. Uh, in fact, it's more complicated than in the 2D case because there are uh, at least uh, three length scales which come into play. But maybe with the, the solution of the forced problem, we will be able to attack uh, in a better way the uh, uh, the, the, the eigenvalue problem. And now, of course, uh, another question which is uh, which I left aside is the role of compressibility. If you mixed all this with uh, acoustic waves, <laughs> what is the result? And I, I, will, uh, I would like to end the, this talk with this picture, which uh, I obtained uh, yesterday, and which is the, the picture of uh, a gravito inertial mode at the surface of Altair, uh, and m equal 11, and which I think uh, we observe uh, with this uh, frequency. And uh, hopefully it will tell us some, uh, uh, 
some new constraints on the rotation and maybe on the brand vicele frequency in the sub layers of, uh, of Altair and give us some new insight in the dynamics of uh, rotating stars. And I think I'm finished. Thank you for your attention.